purchasing, collecting, and preserving 18th and 19th century British satirical prints. My emphasis rests with those works of a culinary nature. So, Queen Charlotte, frying sprats, George III toasting muffins, or placing a fleet of ships in an oven about to be baked, like gingerbread, the Prince of Wales gorging himself on the fortunes of empire, William Pitt carving plum pudding with Napoleon, the American colonies represented as a kettle of fish, and of course the roast beef of England, visual metaphors and similes linking politics to consumption form the basis for select satirists to create a distinct genre of prints which sparked debate, criticism, and dissent. From the mid 18th through the early 19th century, these artists deployed a culinary vocabulary as their visual language to mock the royal family, nobility, and aristocrats. Whether the British Empire was referred to as a pudding or a kettle of fish, the domestic language of food was easily understood by audiences with varied socioeconomic and cultural backgrounds. My research posits that the iconography found in culinary print culture is more than merely humor driven with its easily recognizable foodstuffs. While visually delightful and endlessly comedic, the comestibles employ to <laughs> <not provide laughs> and Parliament expose subtexts that read as political and economic markers of trade and commerce. To feed the body politic, literally and figuratively, was the means by which the British Empire would expand its control internationally, but ultimately falter due to diplomatic conflict and economic hardship. Commenting on contemporary affairs, public figures, and politicos, these works spark debate and serve to demonstrate how print culture served as a disseminating voice through vulgar and oftentimes bawdy imagery, expressing criticism during the reign of George III. The manner in which members of the royal family, nobility, and aristocrats were depicted in satirical form, in addition to the role they played as tastemakers and collectors of the very images that mocked their physical bodies and the body politic, characterized the nature of my research. Within this golden age of caricature, two notable artists stand out, James Gilray and Thomas Rowlandson. Giving visual expression to public opinion, satirists such as Gilray and Rowlandson were well aware of their authority in the public eye. Their depictions of tea, gluttony or starvation, pork, beef, and bread, whether butchered, consumed, or baked, spoke to the conditions and events that ultimately dismantled the empire, non-importation movements in the American colonies, food riots in London and surrounding countryside complex trade embargoes, protests over taxation, and ultimately, revolution. Satires of wealth and abundance with titles such as A Slice of Gloucester Cheese, Delicious Dreams, and Uncorking Old Sherry were complements to equally ominous narratives found in Butchers of Freedom, The Plum Pudding in Danger, or Jews at a Luncheon. This subgenre within the field of political satire utilized a common vocabulary with palatable imagery to reveal the complex political and social state of affairs. One might ask, how many of these culinary inspired prints made their way into royal or aristocratic collections? The answer is the overwhelming majority. George III and the Prince of Wales were prolific collectors of satirical prints and amassed enormous collections despite serving as a subject for myriad diplomatic caricatures. Not framed and displayed as was the practice for some, but kept in folios often arranged by date of acquisition if non-event, collecting satire was a means for the royal family to keep abreast of public discourse and discord, equally important for a governing body often in the midst of internal and external conflict. Whether collected privately or seen in shop windows as a means of public broadcasting, the individuals appearing as the focus of this disaffection were keenly aware of the agency asserted by mass-produced prints. To the Prince of Wales, print sellers sold hundreds of portraits, fanciful images, and theatrical scenes, but also political satires that fed his fascination with figures such as Napoleon and even himself. Ever sensitive to his public image, he at times attempted to suppress satires he deemed too scandalous. A large collection of correspondence related to these suppressed prints in the Royal Archives provides substantial insight into the orders by the prints to buy up existing prints, have plates destroyed, 
and otherwise attempt to protect his reputation. Of course, these efforts were rather futile, as Prince Sellers immediately commissioned new and more rabid imagery in response to attempted censorship. Artists such as Gilray took aim at the royal family in humorous but pointed criticism of the extreme division between the monarchy and the public. The supposed frugality of the king and queen was legendary. In frying sprats, Charlotte is depicted as a simple cook frying cheap oily sardines or sprats over a fire while a pocket full of guineas sags from the weight of a well-worn purse attached at her waist. As a companion piece, George unkempt in his bedclothes and nightcap toasts muffins by a fire where a large kettle hangs to boil. His order of the garter slips unattached. Gilray mocks the minimalist consumption of the royals within the context of a gluttonous empire. The guineas falling from Charlotte's satchel are personally hoarded during her meager meal, while food riots occurred in and around London. From miserly to gluttony, monstrous craws and a new coalition feast suggests George III, Queen Charlotte, and the Prince of Wales satisfying their craving for the national treasury, here labeled as John Bull's blood. Clear, clearly feeding off the labor of Britain, their craws or engorged gullets reveal their insatiable appetites, requiring two-handed feeding as they stuff guineas down their throats. Only the Prince of Wales's pouch is empty, a reference to his constant state of debt. Gilray's influence, influence for this print most likely came from an article in the Morning Chronicle and London Advertiser of May 21st, 1787, in which the Royal Circus was arriving in London, complete with dancing dogs, learned pigs, and quote, three wonderful monstrous craws, wild human beings. A handbill identified them as two women and one man, thus Gilray's depiction of the king in female dress. As damning as the satire is, it too was part of the royal collection. The topic of consumption was a mainstay of culinary inspired prints as collected by George III and most notably the Prince of Wales. Re receipts show that the prince purchased both of Gilroy's Uncorking Old Sherry and Plum Pudding in Danger from publisher Hannah Humphrey, with whom he had an arrangement to continuously deliver him prints. In Plum Pudding, Prime Minister Pitt representing Britain and its empire and Napoleon Bonaparte carve up a pudding representing the world in reference to the near constant battling between Britain and France. Pitt uses his trident shaped fork to skewer a large chunk of ocean, symbolic of des Britain's desire for global naval supremacy. Napoleon, meanwhile, attempts to satisfy his appetite by carving off France, Holland, Spain, Switzerland, Italy, and the Mediterranean. Bonaparte became emperor in December of 1804, and as this print was published in February of 1805, the Prince of Wales was quick to purchase it. Thomas Rowlandson's The Word Eater, for example, depicts Fox in the House of Commons, explaining how he will devour words, speeches, and books. All of these I'll devour next, he says. Here he is mocked for twisting words and manipulating documents, such as the Magna Carta, in support of the prince's efforts. Likewise, the prince was a figure ripe for caricature, given his lifestyle of excess in myriad ways. He was satirized in State Butchers, laid out on a bench about to be butchered by Tory peers, under the direction of William Pitt, who instructs the party to begin by cutting out the prince's heart, saying, the good qualities of his heart will certainly ruin our plan, therefore cut that out first. This trope of aristocratic consumption was fodder for satirists and collectors alike, as we find both were purchased for the royal collection, the prince being obsessed with his own public persona and that of his family. Beyond personal attacks, artists used this medium to address contested commodities, which were both sources of revenue for the empire and at times morally charged foodstuffs. George often discussed fish, tea, rum, and sugar in his correspondence, which corresponds with a number of satirical prints. For example, State Cook or the Downfall of the Fish Kettle shows George III with his back to the fireplace and Lord North standing between the king and an overturned kettle of fish, each labeled as a specific colony. Referring to the lucrative fish trade in North America, 
This image pairs well with letters from the king to north in which restraining the trade and fishery in New England was discussed. In this scene, George says, O oh, Boreas, the loss of these fish will ruin us forever, thus acknowledging the economic importance of the fishing trade in the colonies. He wrote to North, Lord North, the hearty concurrence of the majority of the House of Commons in the measures proposed to be pursued in New England could not be more evident than in with good humor re receiving the motion for the temporary restraining the trade and fishery of that province. James Gilray and his publisher, Hannah Humphrey, capitalized on humanitarian crises of the day, such as the boycott against the use of sugar in protest of the slave trade. In Anti-Saccharites, where John Bull and his family leaving off the use of sugar with the subtitle, To the Masters and Mistresses of Families in Great Britain, this noble example of economy is respectfully submitted. George, Charlotte, Princess Royale, and five other princesses are shown sitting at a modest tea table. With, tea cups to his, with a teacup to his lips, the king declares, delicious, delicious. While the queen in a faux motherly sentiment attempts to quiet the girl's concern about drinking tea unsweetened, who reveal various degrees of disappointment. Oh, my dear creatures, do but taste it. You can't think how nice it is without sugar. And then consider how much work you'll save the poor blacky moors by leaving, leaving off the use of it. And above all, remember how much expense it will save your poor papa. Oh, it's charming cooling drink. Gilray masterfully dispels the appearance of royal sympathy to the cause and suggests a charade as the royal purse is the true measure of their sacrifice. Gilray capitalized on the commitment of over 300,000 Britons who, by the 1790s, refused to consume sugar on the moral grounds that it was produced through inhumane measures by enslaved people, a trade outlawed in England in 1807 with ownership of slaves banned in 1833. Like sugar, culinary-inspired satires at times focused on a singular commodity. During the reign of George III, tea certainly was the most contested comestible between Great Britain and her American colonies. Introduced to the colonies as early as 1670, the Dutch East India Company, by the Dutch East India Company, tea was initially a luxury item. However, by the mid 18th century, it had become a necessity at the well-appointed table. It had also come to symbolize social refinement and domestic grace, but drinking tea properly was a learned behavior. Early misunderstandings occurred by some colonists who boiled tea leaves as one would a vegetable, ate the leaves, and threw out the brewed water. Yet colonists soon adapted to the ceremony of tea drinking, and by the 1760s, they were drinking over one million pounds of imported tea a year. According to British mandates, all tea consumed in American colonies was required to be imported from England. However, substantial market and smuggled tea from Holland provided the same quality at a fraction of the cost. In 1767, Parliament passed the infamous Townsend Act, which placed a duty of three pence per pound on all tea, as well as on paper, glass, lead, and artist paints imported into the colonies. This offense came on the heels of a series of taxation measures, such as the Sugar Act of 64 and the Stamp Act of 65. Although George III repealed most of these taxes, the duties required against tea remained. In response, some colonists began a series of non-importation movements. They refused to purchase imported goods wherever possible, including cloth and tea. Domestic production of homespun and refusal to drink tea smuggled or otherwise demonstrated one's defiance. Rumors spread quickly that English tea was poisonous, politically if not physically. One Boston newspaper advised, let us abjure the poisonous, baneful plant and its odious infusion. Odious and poisonous, I mean, not on account of its physical qualities, but on account of the political diseases and death that are connected with every particle of it. Ladies were therefore encouraged to develop teas from various native plants, already being familiar with their medicinal and curative properties, such as bergamot tea, Labrador tea, and ra a raspberry tea, which was renamed Liberty Tea, and included in American cookbooks well into the 19th century. As taxes and tensions mounted, British artists caricatured the turmoil with tea engravings that depict the tarring and feathering of customs officers, 
The publisher John Bowles, from whom the Prince of Wales purchased numerous prints, commissioned a series of pro-colonial satires, including the engraving A New Method of Macaroni Making, as practiced at Boston. A corresponding caption reads, for the custom house officers landing the tea, they tarred and feathered him just as you see, and they drenched him so well both behind and before that he begged for God's sake they would drench him no more. The image depicts the commissioner of customs, John Malcolm, who in January of 1774 was treated thusly for attempting to collect customs duties in Boston. He was not only tarred and feathered, but threatened with hanging and forced to drink quantities of tea as suggested by the figure approaching Malcolm with the large teapot. Similarly, Bowles's rival, Robert Sayer and J. Bennett, published The Bostonians Paying the Excise Man or Tarring and Feathering. The reference to Malcolm is again made, shown tarred and feathered and forced to down tea with reference to Liberty's frigid cap lying in the foreground and an inverted stamp act tacked to the trunk of the Liberty Tea. Such rough, such rough lampooning was considered justified in light of the offenses committed by Malcolm, who reportedly heckled his captors throughout his ordeal until they in turn threatened to cut off his ears. These prints in support of the colonists appeared after the Boston Tea Party of December 16, 1773, when 340 chests of tea destined for American consumption were rebelliously dumped into Boston's harbor. In retaliation for this act of sedition, Lord North closed the port of Boston in March. The image of North as a coercive figure became popular imagery. The engraving, The Able Doctor, or America Swallowing the Bitter Draft, first appeared in the British publication, The London Magazine, in May, 1774. Lord North, with a copy of the Boston Port Bill in his pocket, is shown accosting the figure of America by the neck. Depicted as a female Indian, North forces tea down her throat while she attempts to spit the tea violently back into his face. Lord Mansfield holds her arms while the womanizing John Montague, fourth Earl of Sandwich, peers up America's skirt. Lord Oot represents military law on the far right, while on the left, figures of France and Spain look on in consultation with one another as Britannia turns away in disgust. The bitter draft is assumed to reference the tea. Numerous recipes for bitter draft existed in the 18th century, including one from a collection of receipts in the Royal Library. This was an herbal tea served hot, capitalizing on the medicinal properties of wormwood, gentian root, chamomile flowers, and cardamom seeds. Brought to a boil and consumed twice a day, this curative brew eased an array of ailments, but most commonly was used as a digestive and for gastrointestinal distress. Identified by the off-putting taste and hallucinogenic properties associated with wormwood and the bitter gentian root, references to bitter draft would have been clearly well known and associated with distress. Thusly, in the engraving, also copied two months later by Paul Revere as the frontispiece for the Royal American Magazine in Boston, the bitter draft would be equated with politically charged and contested tea, a foul tasting potion difficult to swallow demonstrating British sympathies for hard to digest policies and taxes. While the nature of political and cultural criticism seems increasingly fraught in today's media, late 18th and early 19th century viewers of British satirical prints reveled in the rivaled and theatrical imagery that defined the genre. With buffoonish and comical forms, Britain's artists and printmakers lampoon their own government's actions and boldly express public concern for the weakening structure of the empire in prints that were purchased, disseminated, and discussed by an educated and socially elite audience. Body humor provided a poignant vehicle for satirical printmakers who targeted the body politic. This deployment of a clever but derisive strategy on a variety of social and political fronts is a demonstration of how the visual culture of caricatures functioned in the 18th and 19th century. Satirical prints produced by the hundreds or even thousands depending on popularity demonstrate the sustainability of such imagery in the print markets of both Britain and America. The political and social commentaries of James Gilray, Thomas Rowlandson, John Bowles, and a host of anonymous artists were regarded as delightful investments intended for a male audience, well-educated and well-versed in current political affairs. Even today, the satires of the golden age of caricature still resonate, 
with Trump and Putin standing in for Pitt and Napoleon as current politicos provide food for thought. Thank you very much. <laughs>